nuclear-powered megatrain, a project of Soviet engineers. In reality, unlike the nuclear bomber program and the USSR even tested a specially designed reactor in the air, the history of nuclear megatrain design did not go far enough. Before I get to the topic of the video, I want to thank everyone who subscribed to my new Visioner History channel. There I post very interesting and shocking videos on interesting topics. The link to the channel is in the description and in the upper right corner. Well, we continue. Neither experimental models of locomotives were built, nor were the tracks appropriate to the idea. Everything stopped at the level of conceptual designs. At the same time, in contrast to the deeply classified work on the creation of the same nuclear-powered aircraft, the idea of diesel locomotives powered by reactors was promoted in newspapers, books, and popular science magazines. In 1956, the newspaper Goodock, the press organ of the USSR Ministry of Railways, wrote, In conditions of the north, the far east and deserts of Central Asia, it is not always expedient to electrify newly built railway lines. In these conditions it is better to use nuclear locomotives that could work autonomously, without bringing in large amounts of fuel or other materials. Of course, a nuclear locomotive will be much heavier than a steam or diesel locomotive of the same capacity. But if such a locomotive is sent to a remote mainline, for example in the Arctic, it will work there intermittently for a whole winter season without additional supply. It is very easy to turn it into a mobile power plant. In addition, it will be able to supply energy to bathhouses, laundries, and greenhouses for growing vegetables. But cucumber beds beyond the Arctic Circle, of course, were not the limit of dreams for those who believed in a bright future for the railway atom. The idea of megatrains looked much more ambitious and pathological. They were to consist of a powerful nuclear locomotive and giant cars set on a super-wide track, which would be 2.5 to 3 times wider than the country's standard width of 1,520 mm. At the same time, the freight capacity of such a class of cars could be comparable with that of a river cargo vessel and double-deck passenger cars would offer the travelers unprecedented spaciousness and comfort. A nuclear power plant on wheels. Sometimes one hears about nuclear steam locomotive projects, but of course no one was going to spin the wheels of a locomotive by the power of steam. It was planned to use electric motors as a drive for the wheels, which, in turn, would be powered by a nuclear power plant inside the locomotive, built according to a classical scheme. As a result of a nuclear reaction, heat is produced which is transferred to the coolant, which gives the heat to the water in the steam generator. The resulting steam flows through pipes to the turbine, and the turbine in turn drives the shaft of the electric generator. The figure below shows a diagram of a one-section locomotive, in which both the reactor, generator, and electric motors are inside a single body, only the reactor and heat exchanger are covered with a partition of the biosecurity. There is information that a three-section variant was also considered, in which a special section isolated by biosecurity was allocated for the reactor and connected to the other two by a coupling. Monster on the rails. Single-section locomotive, in which the reactor, generator, and electric motors are all located inside a single body. The number of axles of the locomotive is noteworthy, the designers foresaw that its enormous weight would make the load on the tracks more evenly distributed. The idea of a train with a nuclear reactor is simple, and there are no fundamental obstacles to its realization. But then why don't we still ride in palace cars and conquer the Arctic with nuclear-powered locomotives? Obviously, the question about the feasibility of building giant nuclear-powered trains breaks down into two, about the possibility of using nuclear power in passenger transport and about the technical and economic justification of a significant widening of the railroad gauge. Concrete and lead. Actually, nothing prevents the use of nuclear decay energy in the transport industry, and moreover, it is actively used. Approximately 75% of France's electricity is generated by nuclear power plants, so the famous TGV high-speed trains, powered by electricity from the contact grid, can in a sense be considered nuclear trains. But is it possible or necessary to carry the entire power plant with you? The only argument in favor is the possibility of long-term operation of the vehicle without refueling where there is no fuel and no suitable infrastructure. For icebreakers making long voyages in Arctic waters or submarines on combat duty in another hemisphere, long-term energy autonomy is extremely important. 
strategic bombers or anti-submarine warplanes, which could circle the ocean for 24 hours a day away from their base airfields, would also benefit from this capability. But nuclear-powered aircraft were abandoned, for roughly the same reasons that prevented the nuclear locomotive projects from materializing. And the main reason is biological protection. The nuclear reactor of the locomotive would have to be insulated with a thick layer of lead or concrete and from all sides. One could not limit oneself to the wall between the reactor and the driver's cab, because in this case the killing radiation would affect everything on the sides of the track, under bridges and on trestles passing over the tracks. The total weight of such biological shielding would be hundreds of tons, and it would occupy a considerable volume. Considering that the nuclear reactors of the 1950s were themselves very large in size, the size and weight of a nuclear locomotive would have been titanic. Perhaps this is the reason why the designers immediately began to think that the standard track would have to be replaced by an extra-wide track. But is it enough to simply widen the rails to solve this problem? Why should the rails be unscrewed? In the past, a very exotic project of ultra-wide railway lines in the USSR was really discussed. The authors of the idea proposed to remove two inner rails on double-track railroads. The remaining outer rails would form a track about 6 meters wide. Initially, the country's railroads were designed with the greatest overall capacity. If in Western Europe the maximum permissible load per 1 meter of track is 6 tons, in the USA 8.5 to 9 tons on the most part of the main lines, in Russia this value can reach 12 tons. Track facilities, bridges, tunnels, contact network infrastructure are also designed for oversized railcars. There is even a certain reserve for oversized cargo. But all this, of course, is not designed for giant cars and locomotives that could travel along a 6-meter track. It is enough to estimate the possible volume and weight of such a car, and it becomes clear that with a full load, even with 8 axles, the load per 1 meter of track will be dozens of tons. And that's in spite of the fact that the properties of the track, embankments, bridges will remain the same. Obviously, for the atomic megatrain it would be necessary not just to lay a wider track, but to recalculate and create the whole infrastructure. In the end, for technical and economic reasons, the idea of creating one wide track out of two standard ones was rejected. Nazi Germany went much further in the development of the ultra-wide track, 3,000 mm, but even there it did not go beyond the project documentation and after the collapse of Hitler's regime did not return to this idea, considering it a manifestation of economically unjustified gigantomania. I thank you for watching. Your support is very important to me. Your comments and thumbs up motivate me to release new videos on interesting topics. Subscribe and turn on notifications. See you in the new videos.